Okay. Okay, so it'll, it'll be recording from here on out. Um, so don't put your uh, social security number on there or anything, and then we'll be good. <laughs> All right, I better go. Okay, if you get a chance, hop back in. I definitely will. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Will. Thank you. You're amazing. Oh, uh, you are too. <laughs> I'm glad we're working together. All right. Yeah, COVID, COVID brought out the. Oh, we brought out the best in us. Look at all our skills we've developed, you know? Right. Yeah. All right. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Okay, put put that put that blanket in the I was, I was gonna put that blanket so she'll be out of the way when I get ready too. I'm gonna put the blanket in the dryer for a minute and that'll calm us out. Guess what? At the news board, Mark Kay is trying to do his interest on a increase of property tax. And they said, Are you going to your taxes? No. He said, I'm paying interest on it. I don't think he's going to pay property taxes. This is in Melbourne Burgess? That is Martavis Jones, and they ask him. Where's he wanting to pay more taxes? Because he's crazy. I can't think of any other reason. More property tax. I think he said so the city workers would get a raise, but strictly thing, we can't go for tax because everybody's suffering right now. Now the time to go up. Hi, Allison. Oh. Hey, Charlotte. How are you? 
I'm good. <laughs> Trying to get everything working. I, I had to test it out, make sure it all worked. Oh, there <laughs> I, I I was the same way because Will is in clinic. Uh, ben has a new job. Oh my. Uh, who else? Dustin is working hard, working doing something this afternoon, and Kendall it has another appointment. Oh, so that meant okay. Who's left? Who's left sitting the table? Oh, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> So I've, I've done it from school, you know, like my school virtual stuff. And I thought it was going to be something really different, but actually it's not. No. So just, just get in there and do it. Yeah. Yeah. I got me a new camera and everything today. So. Uh -oh. <laughs> so you're, you're on it. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Well, I called AC because there was a, he ran into what Jim and said he didn't know if it was Zoom or a personal meeting or whatever. And then I said, well, I've, I've talked to him and I thought I told him Zoom. And then, and then Jim sent me another email today and said, oh, he still doesn't know, but I told him Zoom. So I called AC and I was like, okay, so it is Zoom, blah, blah, blah. He said, well, I never got a meeting announcement on it. And I said, you should have. He said, no, I didn't. Then I said, look for one that says Denise. No. Yeah. <laughs> he said, I get so many emails. I didn't even he read does. the Denise. He said, I kept looking for Charlotte Hoyle. Oh, yeah. So it worked out. Yeah. Well, That's right. why he said, well, I'll be there, I'll be there early because I don't want to have any technical difficulties or anything. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like to be the first one on the call. <laughs> right. So he, so he thinks, obviously, he thinks like we think. Yes. <laughs> So I'll be taking presidential notes and Zoom notes. Okay. Now, now last week, well not last week, it was last week because we were going week. Didn't Beverly Robertson say that Memphis had the most African American IT? Did she say males? I think she did. In the in, in the nation. I kept thinking, did I hear that right? She did say that, didn't she? She did. I was taking notes. Let me see. I found her uh, presentation very enlightening. Oh, yeah. And it was quite inspiring, right? Yes. Uh, I, did, I did not. Okay, we've got to, we have to get back with it anyway, because she wants to sort of partner with us. So sort of like use us as a focus group when she needs one. Oh, okay. So I'll be able to get with her then. Oh, great. But she did say something like that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to shut up so you can go in and finish your notes. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm good. <laughs> and you didn't have anything in particular you wanted me to say about uh, Mary? No. No. I, I, I believe in letting grown people be grown people. Okay. <laughs> Everybody knows, everybody knows him. So you can just go at it any way you want to. Okay. Yeah. Well, I don't want to go on too long. Have you met him before? Yes. Yes, I have. So, so he'll probably remember you. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, because now, because now you can see everybody up front, you know, it's just like, <laughs> and their name. And the name. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I've met him a couple of times. He he came over on our uh, block a few times for parties. <laughs> uh -huh. Which block is that? Uh, we're on Benton between Melrose and Willat. Oh, yeah. You're yeah. a true Midtowner. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. We're, we're um, just so glad to have you with us. You just, you just jumped right in. Well, had to, you know, definitely had to get in there. But that, that's kind of like the Midtown spirit, though, isn't it? <laughs> it is, isn't it? it yeah, I, I think if you uh, want to live in Midtown, you, you want to be a part of Memphis. Right, you know? right.
Mm-hmm. Hi, Belinda. Hey, Belinda, how are you? Hey, Charlotte, I'm fine. How are you? Great, good to see you. Do you know, good to do, see you Allison, you. Yeah, do you know Allison already? Allison Harris? I don't think we've met before. No, hi, Allison. Hi, okay. good to see okay. you. <laughs> Allison, permit me to introduce Belinda. <laughs> Berlinda is the hometown, homegrown Tigers, Memphis fan, and Jeopardy contest winner, and a Jeopardy winner. Oh, I saw you. That's so awesome. That was me. That, that was everything. I had Just to get on the job. stage. Yeah, you. Oh, yeah. I am. Um, you know, it was... It was something I never thought I would do. And when I got there to be up there and play, and I, it's funny, I, of course, I recorded the episode yeah. and I actually rewatched it today 
And I looked at him and I thought, wow, I did look pretty calm, didn't I? I said, who knew? <laughs> but you know, you don't, you don't know what you look like. And I was, and you know how people talk sometimes. And you know, so I said, okay. I said, I didn't look that bad. There we go. But I had a great time. It was fun. Oh, how wonderful. Oh, that yeah. makes my day. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I've tried out to get on it for years and years. And, yeah. you know, it's just, you have to keep after it. And yeah. I did. I was just happy that I said, please, God, don't let me end up in the negative or do something really embarrassing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm going to. I wouldn't tell anybody. I'm like, I hope none of my friends see this show today. <laughs> oh, well. Are you, Maria? Hi, darling. Right. Doing well. Is, have you moved yet to Memphis yet? I'm in Memphis now. Yay. So you've moved? I moved. I live, um, I decided to come to Hyde Park so that yeah. I can do some of my community organizing work here and make this my base camp. <laughs> yeah, hi, hi, Robert. We just have the meet and greet here. Hello, Charlotte. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Right. We're just we're just having great fun speaking to our um, Jeopardy Jeopardy celebrity winner, our Jeopardy celebrity host here. Did you see Belinda Henning from Memphis when she was on Jeopardy? No, I don't think so. No, you probably were at work, Robert, because you always at work. <laughs> You're safe. You're good then, Bob. If you didn't, see <laughs> yeah. She was a winner, Bob. Wow. In, in one day, she won $17,000 plus in one day. Congratulations. That's a good, that's a good, good hour. <laughs> good hour's work. That's, that's pretty good for basically 20 minutes. I said, hmm, maybe I'll invoice my next client at that rate and see what happens. <laughs> Belinda's an HR, HR consultant. Is that what we call it now, Belinda, HR yeah. consultant? Eight people, Memphis, HR and leadership consulting. Okay. I, and I guess you have to read a lot to be on Jeopardy, right? <laughs> you know, the thing is, it's like playing trivia anywhere. You have to have a broad knowledge base because you never know what the categories are going to be. And if you, all you've ever done is, you know, read books and you don't know anything about geography or history or mm -hmm. sports or you know music I said you're in trouble and that's why you know you you have to be well-rounded and I think it's not so much reading I mean it, it helps if you recognize things you know and say oh I've heard of that but a lot of it is when you read the clues if you read the clues carefully and quickly they're giving you a hint in there Okay. But you've got to pick up on it. And, you know, you are you do this in real time. So the little bitty time you have to look, to read that clue and think, I've got it and buzz in, you know, that's, that's what it amounts to. So it's thinking on your feet and being able to use your buzzer and not freak out if you miss one. That's great. Hi, hey, Alfred, Dr. Hall. How are you? How are you? Good afternoon. We see a big U of M sign in the back, so we're, we're convinced. <laughs> There's some you know your is. There. <laughs> Wonderful. Or subliminal messaging. That's yeah. Subliminal <laughs> and Maria has just moved here from, from Pasadena, right? Uh, yes, from Los Angeles. Uh, Palm Springs specifically is where I came from, but I grew up in Los Angeles. I was, I'm a community organizer, so I decided to become a member of Hyde Park to learn about my community and learn about uh, what's going on and how I can contribute. Okay, Robert always needs volunteers. <laughs> oh, okay, what do you do, Robert? That's a historic neighborhood that you're part of. Mm -hmm. That's neat. Okay, I look forward to learning. Um, I, I'm open to interviews, one on one conversations, so you can imbue your information to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, 
fairly robust community development industry, or maybe that's the wrong word, but uh, community development corporations here in Memphis uh, that gather together um, with an organization used to be the Community Development Council of Memphis. I think it's called Bridge now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'd be a great place to connect uh, with people that yeah. have been involved in community work for a long time. I would love an introduction if you're open to it. I did meet the gentleman who's, a, who's with the CDC. I think I'm from, I forget the community, Na National Boulevard. And then somebody, uh, an introduction I got to Orange Mound and somebody from Frazier. Um, yep. I'm just learning about Hyde Park right now. <laughs> yep. Yeah, how would I get um, information on the council? I would love to, to learn more. Yeah, I'd have to, let me see if I can pull up its website. When I was real involved with it, it was the Community Development Council. Okay, uh, thank you. And speaking of council, I did reach out to my council member to just say hi <laughs> and learn. Hello, Mayor. Good afternoon. We're just sitting here having a council meeting waiting for you. <laughs> Finish. We're voting on your budget. <laughs> need that. Mayor, have you met Verlinda? I know you know everybody on this page already, but have you met Verlinda Henney? Uh, have I met whom? I'm sorry. Verlinda Henney. She's waving. I see her waving, but I do not think I've had the pleasure of meeting think, her. Uh, well, actually, I don't think we introduced each other, but you and I checked out right behind each other at Piccadilly uh, <laughs> before the pandemic. Uh, no. Piccadilly on the top floor. Piccadilly. So I remember seeing you. Kroger. Jason. Nice to see you. <laughs> Belinda, Belinda, tell tell AC what you did, and Adele. Adele just joined oh, yeah. us. I know Denise already knows. <laughs> oh, well, you want? Okay, Charlotte, I will. I <laughs> you, no, I mean we like the news. Well, all right. So, last, back in well, anyway, back in September of eighteen, I tried out for Jeopardy here in town. And they called me in the January of 19 and said, hey, can you come out? But then nothing ever happened because Alex Trebek got sick and then the pandemic happened. And so they called me again this year, right after we had that big snow in February, said, could you come out in March? So I flew out to LA in March and filmed my episode and I won. So um, I got to play two games and represent Memphis well and my Tigers well. And so it was just a lot of fun. I was, I enjoyed it. And I'm sorry, I consumed so much information. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's see, Jeopardy comes on. 3.30. On channel, channel three and 3.30 Monday. Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, congratulations. Mm. 17000 17, dollars in twenty minutes, Mayor. Well, I'll, I'll take that. I mean, I only bought that. Let me try to take these two dogs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll try to around. See. Double. How are you, Austin, Galen, Brian? Oh. How's everyone? Right. Will's in clinic, so I'm so I'm the techno for tonight. So awesome. any mistakes, blame it on Will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Robert is here to help you. <laughs> Robert can sure. take care of it. Talk to you when we go. Brian, while we're waiting, how are things over at Le Bonheur? Church Health. Church Health, they're, yeah. They're, Church Health, they're excuse great. me. Forgot no, you're page. Good. They're great. For those that were at Maximo's, too. Uh, I found my wallet. Oh, good. Yeah. Gosh. Hey, 
Hey, Judge. Hey, Elvis. Hi there. Hey, Judge, what was the name of that uh, meditation site that you that you mentioned last week? Pray as you pray, go. Pray, pray what? Pray as you go. Oh, pray as you go. Oh, okay. Yeah. The norms. The norms. Yeah. I've got to check it out. Hello, Melissa. We'll be starting in about two minutes. Good afternoon, everyone. BJ. BJ. Hi, now. Hi, BJ. Hey, now. Thank you. Hi, Galen. He's muted. Oh, there he is. Mayor, I, I saw you over at Kroger's, um, but you were wearing a mask and I was wearing, wearing a mask. And I don't think you had any idea who I was. I, I think you just thought I was some beautiful woman that you knew. But, <laughs> but, uh, I know that. What can I say? That's I anyway, but I didn't want to embarrass you by, you know. Well, I probably turned my head because I didn't wish to come turn into a pillow saw, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mayor, so you've been spotted at Piccadilly, Kroger, Jason's, and you just can't hide. <laughs> oh, look, everybody knows me around the uh, Starbucks at uh, <coughs> Kroger. Hi, Pam, how you doing? Hi, fine, nice to see you. Uh, Kroger. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, the, and and the YMCA. We got two messages today about you at the YMCA. So you're just being stalked by Midtown Memphis Rotary Club. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I believe it was Jim. Uh, you know, I work out every morning, and Jim. I cannot think of his last name. Drummonds. That's it. Yeah, yeah. We've been working out together for years, and he told me. First, I had forgotten the exact time. He wanted to remind me to be on time. So uh, if Jim logs on, I'll have to tell him thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Not letting me forget the day. Yeah, well, well, Catherine does a great job of keeping up with you. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's hard. And it's even worse once we start traveling uh, for uh, Alsac right now on the ground. But there are three monitors in front of me. I look like a weather forecast or something because I have to, I have St. Jude on one screen uh, and I have St. Jude on two screens and we're on my private screen for my private business. <laughs> Great. So do you have a St. Jude screen and an ALSAC screen? Yes. Well, two screens for ALSAC St. Jude and it's okay. behind that. They keep you busy. Yes. Oh, that's right. You should know. Right, because, hey, yeah. you made me a star at St. Jude. <laughs> I got a bonus because of you. Oh, nice. A program. A great program. Yeah. Uh, Allison will introduce you. You want to start? It's, it's 535, so oh, yeah, uh, we have some guests. So, Allison, you want to get started? Yes. Yes. Um, and, and for those I haven't met yet, my name is Allison Harris. I'm a new member to the Rotary. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and just to start on a personal note, my friend Pam Skelton, she used to work for A.C. Wharton, and she said it was her honor to carry his briefcase into a courtroom. <laughs> and I feel the same way about introducing him today. I think we all know him. He's He's been our Shelby County Public Defender, the mayor of Shelby County, and the mayor of Memphis. And he's done some so many great things for our city. And some of my favorites is that he advocated for books from birth. He developed Shelby County's first infant mortality reduction program. He co-founded the city of Memphis's first ever uh, economic development office. And he also worked to build the bike lanes that we see all throughout the city. So I don't think I need to say anything further. Let's welcome Mayor Wharton. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Good afternoon to uh, <coughs> all of you, to my 
friend of long standing, uh, Charlotte Hall. Thank you uh, so much for uh, chasing me down and asking if I uh, would appear. You know, when I left the mayor's office, uh, I've, I've always felt that persons who succeed, you in office, ought to have free birth and you just go on and get out of the way because we don't follow that at all levels of politics these days. So <laughs> I, I do have a downtown office, but for, I guess, about a year, I did not put anything uh, on the door because I want to make sure I was out of the way. Uh, I'm on the floor in the building here with a Supreme Court judge and two appellate court judges and a U.S. senator. So I said, this is a secure floor. No one will find me. Of course, uh, ultimately, they did find me. So I had to go ahead and put a sign uh, on the door. Uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing uh, immensely because it's, uh, it's with children. Of course, I do some other things to uh, to pay the rent, but I spend most of my time on programs impacting uh, children. Uh, having been a public defender, uh, having um, been on the Tennessee Higher Education Commission uh, longer than any other person, I'm still there. Ned Mc, no, 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 no. Lamar Alexander appointed me whenever that was, and I'm still there. Um, and having chaired a hospital board at Methodist Public Defender doing criminal justice, uh, I've had a, a few opportunities to really study and reflect and see firsthand uh, where are they coming from. Um, when I say they, I mean those of us who have gotten into our juvenile court uh, on delinquency matters, and of course, those who uh, unfortunately graduate uh, into our um, prisons and jails. So uh, I, I learned a long time ago that while we can have great reentry programs uh, and great programs within our penal institutions, uh, the best answer is hey, why don't you do something to keep them from getting in there in the first place? There's not much of a ROI on prisons. Have you ever seen a study or anybody conducted, um, hey, how much, what are we getting out of these uh, prisons? What are we getting out of these jails? Nobody's ever, ever tried that uh, because quite frankly, there is no uh, return on investment in that. So it only makes sense that if there's no ROI on that, hey, put all your money, your big bucks, on where you will get uh, a return. So let me, and I'm only going to talk a few minutes and then open it up uh, for questions. I think uh, at an evening session like this, um, folks don't want to hear some long numbers, 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 and uh, putting everybody uh, to sleep. So let me start back in the county mayor's office. Uh, when I took over, the first notice I received was that uh, the federal government was going to defund our Head Start uh, program. And that was the first thing uh, on my desk. Of course, now I had two choices. Uh, the jail was in federal court and the federal court, excuse me, the federal government was saying it was going to defund our Head Start program. Now, uh, most people would have said, well, since you've got a federal judge breathing down your back, you better take care of that first. I felt otherwise. I took care of Head Start first, and I never regret uh, that decision. First of all, with respect to the prisons, the judge had pretty well gotten all the money out of us that the county had. Just before I took office in 2002, the prior county commission decided they would pay everything that they owed, and they signed one check for $33 million out of the rainy day fund. And, of course, it was my job to uh, 
make that up. It was easy for them to spend it. They basically said, hey, we won't have to worry about it. You got a new administration coming in. Let that sucker worry about all of this. So I said, look, let's, let, let's get to work on the children. I, I want to touch on this because everybody focuses on children once they get uh, in K through 12. Why? Because you have a school board. But have you ever heard of the board of early childhood? When our children need the most attention, they have the least attention. Because we all know that when it comes to brain development, it is pretty much well formed by the time that child gets into K. And it's pretty difficult uh, for the teachers to sort of unwire that. A child's brain, uh, and when I make speeches, I use this uh, example. If you put a wet, sticky coat of paint uh, on your wall, and before you can post the wet paint signs, somebody comes along and slaps their big hand right in your freshly painted wall. And what do you do the minute you see that? If you get there before the paint dries, it's, you smooth it out and put another coat on top of it and the wall comes out perfect. A child's brain is sort of the same way. In those early years, it is so impressionable. Adversity is going to happen. I'll touch on adverse childhood in just a minute. But the key is what do you do before the paint dries? Uh, and tragically, that's one of the areas uh, in which we are really getting behind in Shelby County. Sit in the county and the state have just done great. The state only funds 40% uh, of, of pre-K. That leaves 60%. Memphis and Shelby County, and this is really a brag point for us. Memphis and Shelby County has stepped up uh, local funds, which is really great, and particularly great in terms of city, which wants the pulled out from the city. Uh, the city had no obligation to fund the schools. Now, I disagreed with that, but it happened, and I can't, cannot undo it now. But in any event, in light, it's still, in spite of the fact that the city has no legal obligation to put one dollar on public education, it still stepped up. And the same thing with county government, which does not have a legal obligation to fund pre-K, the county stepped up. So while there's a lot of misery here, if you want to brag about something, pick the fact that our local governments and the philanthropic sector also uh, have stepped up and we're funding uh, high quality pre-K uh, for all children uh, without uh, charge. Because those are the ones, those children are the ones who need it most. But I learned also that even before they get to pre-K, uh, going all the way back, that we had at the time I uh, created the intramortality program, we had an intramortality rate of, uh, oh, it was like third world, third world countries. So I heard what, um, well, the Commercial Appeal run an outstanding series on it. So uh, then Governor Bredesen uh, had been becoming increasingly concerned about the same thing. So we started 
the infant mortality reduction program, uh, which in one form or the other still uh, goes on. I'm touching on those because this is where the children have the least protection, but the greatest need. And I hope that as concerned and involved public citizens, uh, the members of this club and in your private capacities will begin focusing on what is happening uh, to these children zero uh, up to uh, uh, to they, the time that they get in pre-K. Uh, we had a program that uh, made a big dent in our infant mortality rate. Uh, that program still continues. There's been some up and downs. So again, make sure that while it's good to focus on K through 12, what happens in the schools uh, is no better than what comes into the schools. Um, so we made sure that the mothers had everything they needed to carry that child for term and then make sure that the child um, had the, it's not too much to say, can I at least reach my first uh, birthday? I don't know exactly how the program looks now, but I do hope that you will make it your business to see what we're doing. Look at our mortality rates, which means a child dying uh, before it reaches its first anniversary. One other thing that just really troubles me to this day that no one has really touched. Um, while I was county mayor, Barbara Nixon, Barbara Holden and I, and a few other, uh, Nancy Begotten, uh, Ellen Roth, really became concerned about um, the adverse childhood circumstances. It didn't have a real name. In other words, a trauma that our children uh, are exposed to, uh, they get overexposed to it every day. Um, and again, we do not have a comprehensive uh, publicized effort so that every time uh, is, is screened. Um, if I were back in office and had my way, you know, just as you cannot get into school if you do not have all your, your records of immunization, I think at the same time, there should be a screening for any traumatic circumstances that child is being exposed to. Uh, marital discord, member of the family incarcerated, member of the family addicted uh, to drugs, all of those things. I'm sure all of you know what they call the ACE factors. And there's a, a matrix on which you can get, get measure what the score is. We did a study in Shelby County, not based somewhere else, and found out that at least 52% of all, all people living in Shelby County, particularly children, had a very high and unacceptable um, score on the adverse childhood experience measure. Many of that uh, arises out of the fact that there's someone in the family unit, whether it's an older son, boyfriend, husband, other partner or mate who is now in prison or in jail. That is just all too common uh, in Shelby County, Tennessee. One of the programs uh, I've been working on and still pursuing that I hope we will eventually be able to get here in Memphis as a program called Handle with Care. Now, if you live in the city the way I do, uh, gunshots, uh, and not just one here and there, uh, or maybe once a week, but every night, gunshots uh, are just a, a nightly fair, and sometimes during the day. Children hear those gunshots too. They see people ducking. They wonder why mom is saying, get under the bed, get in the bathtub. Keep in mind that that child then goes to sleep, tries to go to sleep. 
with the fear in his little mind and memory that mom just told him you gotta get under the bed so one of those bullets on hit you and kill you. And that same child then at seven, seven thirty or whatever, uh, steps into someone's classroom. And we expect that little child to be bright eyed and bushy tailed and just eager to learn. That's all they, yes, ma'am, teacher. May I, may I, may I, teacher? When that child, in his or her own way, is still trembling uh, and their mind is not in that classroom because they're wondering it's the same thing that happened last night going to happen tonight. So there are some cities in East Tennessee, and I've studied the programs uh, that have programs called Handles Care. Are any of you familiar with uh, those programs? You work with your law enforcement agencies 24 seven. And whenever a law enforcement officer makes the scene of any kind of crime uh, where there are children present, and through my many years, I do know that most domestic violence aggravated assault cases, uh, their children present. Uh, they may be upstairs, they may be in the basement, in the closet, under the bed, or whatever, but they're there. They may be out of sight, but those that trauma is not out of their minds. So an ideal program that, and I'm still pushing it, and I hope you'll get behind it, it's called Handle with Care. What happens is the police officers will then fill out a simple note that is transmitted to the local education agent, local school, wherever. It doesn't give any real embarrassing details. It simply says to whom it may concern, please be aware that ex student uh, was involved in or witnessed uh, an incident that may have affect, affected him or her emotionally. They don't spell out all the horrible details. And does the teacher go to the child and immediately say, oh, I heard there was a the mom and boyfriend get in the fight? No. It simply puts the teacher and the support personnel on notice that, look, if there's something unusual today, don't punish the child. Don't send her to the office. Don't scold her. Because when that happens, the research shows that it simply compounds what happened to the child at home last night or over the last weekend. Here's a little child who sees the school as the place of ultimate safety. But then when they get to school, they get emotionally, in quotes, attacked. And that defeats and changes their whole view of what education is about. Uh, Mayor Strickland supports the program. There are some legal privacy concerns that we have to work through. But I do hope that in your other organizations you will look for a way to support those uh, to support those programs. Now, well, what about how does all how does all that fit into our educational system? Uh, again, I don't know all of your backgrounds, but uh, I'll just repeat what uh, you probably heard over and over again. Uh, by third grade. Tennessee students are significantly behind uh, with nearly two thirds not proficient in English uh, and math. Um, and that's if they, once they get to that, to the eighth grade, and once they experience the first failure, uh, that changes they, uh, their whole attitude toward what the school is about because they keep failing. This person 
whom they've learned to trust and respect to the utmost, now has the job of telling them you didn't do well. Teach, but you told me I was sweet. You told me I was smart. And now you're telling me I'm not doing well. Publish is not communicated that way. But those are the messages uh, that, that come out. I just saw someone in the chat room was normal about Handle With Care. They do have websites, and I'll make sure that I get back to the person who had that question. Now, once they fail, uh, and by the third grade, uh, it is very difficult to overcome that. Uh, no matter how much you have in the way of, 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 of quality teachers, uh, highly capable teachers, uh, at that early age, go back to my wet paint example with the handprint that is not remediated, is not painted over, follows them all uh, the way through. If you will look at the websites, of the, it's called TQEE, Tennesseans for Quality Education. I'm not going to go through everything here with you, but it's one of the best websites I have seen that spells out what concerned and interested citizens really uh, should look for and advocate for uh, and push their elected representatives uh, to support let me just make uh, one thing here to show how it's not a matter of spending more money. You may have read of the 700 plus, I've forgotten the precise change, numbers that the state just had up there in TANF funds. TANF funds, for those who may not know, uh, are funds that are allotted, the name of the program is Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. For some reason, Tennessee wasn't spending it. It was just putting so much of it in a vault that we were risking losing that money. Well, obviously you couldn't just, with the flick of a switch, started looking for folks who were getting other forms of support. So TQEE wisely uh, convinced the governor and the legislature Listen, if we take care of these children who later become adults, at the early stage, uh, they'll be able to finish school, finish community college or college, get a job. This is the best way, Governor, to reduce dependency and the number of families who are on the temporary assistance uh, for needy families roster. Fortunately, uh, TQEE led the effort to get that money, oh gee, uh, millions of it, I've forgotten the exact number, to go into early quality childhood education programs, including some of the services, helping to ameliorate those adverse childhood circumstances that arise out of encounters uh, with uh, uh, domestic violence, police officers, and whatever under those horrible circumstances, which in a way, um, to the degree that many children at an early age began to disrespect law enforcement officers, when the first experience they had with a law enforcement officer was when mom and dad got into a big fight. Both of them were injured. Uh, Tennessee law requires, it's not the police officer's um, decision. Tennessee law requires that when there's been an incident of domestic violence, where there is injury and where the police cannot ascertain precisely who's defendant and who's the victim, uh, there's a presumption under Tennessee law that the parties should be arrested. Now imagine when that happens, when a five or six year old is standing in the corner bawling 
and the police officer following his or her duty takes mom and dad away. Doesn't do you any good that the police officer gives you a teddy bear and some unknown stranger comes and picks you up two hours later and takes you off to Child Protective Services, juvenile court, or whatever. I, I, I threw that in there because we sometimes wonder how can adults be as disrespectful to law enforcement as they are? But just look at that scenario, and that plays out all too often. Talk to police officers. When we introduced the Handle with Care program, and I met with the officers, I met with former Director Rollins, and he said, where has this program been? We need that here. You've heard it said, my teacher in Lebanon, Tennessee, always said when we were cutting up, you sow winds, you reap whirlwinds. We're sowing winds of fear and disrespect in these children when the police officers do their job, and it turns into whirlwinds that furthers that disrespect. Now, that same, all of that flows through the failures of pre-K and even before they get to pre-K, all of that runs all the way through to our higher education system, where I now uh, serve, uh, we have a difficult time. Former Governor Haslam uh, saw the money we were putting into higher education. He said, but where are your measurements? How do I know what I'm paying for? Uh, so he came up with the drive to 55, in which by the year 2025, at least 55% of Tennesseans will have some type of degree. It could be at the college level, it could be at uh, one of the colleges of applied te technology or community college. But here's what we're finding now, and I will uh, conclude with that. Uh, black students are more than twice as likely as white students to be academically underprepared by the K-12 system when entering higher education. Half of all college intending Hispanic students suffer what they call melt in the summer between high school and higher education. In other words, a child may have been right on the edge when they finished high school, but by the time they try to enter college, a lot of that is gone. That's what they call the, uh, the melt. Uh, the uh, score distribution, ACT score, um, is uh, for black students uh, only, let's see, I think it's about 32% need some remediation. And it's just, we're not doing good on preparing our students for college, particularly the black and brown students. Um, and failure at the higher education level is one of the worst things because usually the oldest child who goes off to college, community college or whatever, and everybody has big dreams, but after two years um, or one year after a few months, that oldest child is back home and really silent on college or higher education then that's going to have a ripple deterrent effect on the younger children. So let me stop there. The bottom line is that uh, from birth all the way through, investments in education uh, are the best investments we can weigh. And stated to the contrary, deficits in those uh, areas uh, are the greatest uh, hindrance to our city, our county, our state uh, in progressing as we should. Let me stop there, uh, Madam President, if that's okay. You on mute. Blame it on Will. Hey, we have some questions in the chat box. What is the name of the education organization that you mentioned? Uh, Tennesseans for quality education. 
uh, as a matter of fact, is headed by a Memphian, uh, Blair Taylor, who is in all things education. And not only does she head up Memphis tomorrow, but she's now the CEO of Tennesseans for Quality Education. It's not merely a Memphis uh, initiative, uh, it's across the state. And that's why they have been so successful. That's another brag point that we need here in, uh, in Shelby County. We're, we're taking the lead on that. TQEE. -E. And we'll put that, Denise, I, will you put that in the chat box? And the one, the question on uh, handle of the care, I see someone has provided the link. Um, uh, just let the, uh, uh, I'm reading the chats here. All I can say is someone like the metaphor. You know, there, there are any other, and to get people to understand this, um, and I know all of you have heard it, it's like hardwiring the motherboard in computers. You don't hear that phrase used now. Uh, if it's simply something wrong with the keyboard or whatever, uh, you send it off or take it to the shop and they repair it. But once they say, hey, the motherboard, the brain of your computer, is messed up. Um, they say you may as well get you a new one. We can do that with computers, but we can't do that with the brains of our little children. So why, why would we even think of neglecting their development uh, in any way? Um, I was discussing education with someone recently. It was I mean, me. <laughs> it was with me. <laughs> some, but they said, well, you know, education is the answer to all of that. And I said, yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. But let's deal with the reality of it. Nothing that I have discussed here has an immediate return. Pre-K, handleable care. You can institute those programs. And if you expect that by the end of this governor's term or that mayor's term, everything is perfect. And here is the, the difficulty that we all face. People want immediate results. And particularly when it comes to safety. Uh, everybody, we have a new police director. Let's give her two weeks. And when the gunshots continue, you're going to hear people say, I thought they brought somebody in here. You could do something about that stuff. Uh, they're still in more cars. They're still in. And if she says, well, give me three years and I can at least turn around. Say what? We thought you were going to get this done right now. Um, if my roof is leaking, I call a roofing company, and they don't say, well, Miss Hoyle, I know you want that leak fixed, but we can do a little bit of work on it today. Maybe we'll put a tarp on it or something. But it's going to be about four years before we can really fix your roof so it will stop leaking in your bedroom. Will we accept that? No. Well, we now think that our teachers, our educational systems, our police departments are expected to deliver within the same time frame. So we try programs. If they don't end crime in two years, Hey, it ain't working. Cut it out. And somehow we have to develop a willingness on the part of our citizens to understand that no school superintendent, no principal, no police chief, 
is going to be able to promise you peace and safety in our streets um, overnight or in a month's time. It just won't happen. So people aren't willing to support it. Uh, and here's where we can all come in. When I was chief public defender, I had enough sense to know that I was not going to be able to go out to hardworking taxpaying citizens and tell them that they needed to give me more money so I could do a better job of defending the guy who snatched their purse two weeks ago or stole the catalytic converter off their car while it was parked in the huh? Uh, uh, heaven forbid, rob them at gun. You're not, they're never going to say, okay, sure. Here's more money for that. So what we all have to do, support our teachers, our law enforcement people. If you cannot sell the product, sell the integrity of the process. And this is why uh, candor, and openness on the part of our school systems, on the part of our law enforcement. Uh, just make sure that we can trust the process. If we can trust the process, we'll stay with you, Chief Davis. Superintendent Ray, if we trust your process, we will stick with you. So try to convey to your fellow members and neighbors, family members, that nothing we are going to do is going to elevate the scores, stop the shooting, uh, cut, just, just cut out all evil uh, because we have a new police director or a new school uh, superintendent. But that's what we want, quite frankly. Uh, uh, with respect to handle with care, if they're in school, um, there's no age uh, cutoff. Uh, because again, particularly in those tricks between when they're going free teens or whatever, in which they um, have a sense to say, look, I'm, I'll be a, a lady, I'll be a woman soon. I'm 12, 13 now. And after I saw what happened to my mother uh, last night, I just don't know whether I want to grow up or not. You've heard of the increase in the number of suicidal uh, threats and all uh, in adolescence preteens um, since uh, the, uh, the pandemic. Well, imagine children living every day in a pandemic. And that's what the families, uh, where the violence, the shooting, uh, and everything is just a nightly affair. They are living in an everlasting pandemic. There is no break doesn't stop on Sundays to go to church, doesn't stop on the way to school. So my bottom line is we just have to do a much better job of uh, protecting uh, our children. That's basically it. I can say that, I don't need a degree. Um, well, see, those of us you, who know me, Ruben and I have got three boys by the marriage and three that we, quote, adopted. And now we have seven grandsons and one uh, granddaughter. And uh, I've never been as fearful as I have now. Uh, one of my sons and daughter in laws just said they were so concerned about their children having to peep in those computers all day long. And 
they were just, it was having a horribly uh, negative effect on them. I mention that because that's just a snapshot of their lives, but their children who live that pandemic every day with no relief in sight, but people like all of us participating in this meeting uh, can give them a chance of relief in sight. Uh, and I see one question here, lead uh, problems, um, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, the uh, Memphis Housing Authority, as well as the county, uh, have done God, a, a, a good job of uh, getting the lead out of the old uh, houses and buildings. What we, we had a lot of controversy about why we just tore down some of the old, quote, public housing, close court units, you cannot remediate the asbestos and the lead bank. Or it was better just to tear them down. Um, and with Section 8 housing, uh, we made sure that if they have the uh, lead paint remediation also. Uh, I don't know how much of that is going on now because we have built so much new housing stock. But you're absolutely right. The concentrations really, um, the, the lead paint uh, really hits the child's developmental, hits them uh, at, I would say, 11 and 12 years old. I used to represent the Memphis Housing Authority. The reason I became familiar with that and I was overseeing the contractors on the lead paint. That, that's really a hidden enemy there we need to hear much more about. Uh, someone just read the book, What Happened to You? Oh, yes, Conversations on Trauma. Uh, if, we, if we start asking that, what happened to you as opposed to what's wrong with you, uh, we'll go a long way on taking better care of our children. We now look at them and say, what's wrong with you, girl? And when they're acting out as opposed to saying, what happened to you, you'd be surprised and shocked at the answers you receive. Uh, let's see, other questions? How, uh, uh, what Gary Shore, uh, Child Institute, Urban Child Institute, uh, Gary is supporting, there's another just really tremendous program going on in Memphis and Shelby County called The First Day. Uh, Kathy Buckman uh, Gibson chairs that board. Uh, Gary Shaw, the Urban Child Institute, uh, supporting that. Uh, the Urban Child Institute was very supportive of the AIDS Awareness Foundation that I represented uh, for for many years that dealt with trauma um, in, in young children. And Pam wants to know, what is your feeling about police presence in schools? Oh, listen, I tell you what, uh, if it's done in the right way, where the police officers have a chance to introduce themselves early on so the children begin to see them as their friends, someone they can trust, do not simply call them and let the children find out about it when they have to wrestle some big old boy down in the hallway in front of the whole student body. Because they don't, they just witness it. They don't know what went on. Uh, one of the most distressing things in my life, I was coming out of the uh, Benjamin Hooks Library one day. I had, had some appearance in there. I saw two police cars in the drive, and I heard uh, a little boy just, just screaming, not just the usual acting up scream. If you've been around children, you know a real scream on fear or hurt than you do just wanting attention. So, being nosy, I just walked over to the police officer and I said, 
is he is he lost? What what what's going on? The officer shook his head and he said, and he pointed to a woman who was standing over there. Um, he said, "No, his mama just wanted us to come out here and scare him." She said he was acting up uh, in the library. Is that a way? I mean, think how that child now feels about police officers and will feel for the rest of his life. Uh, Jossie, thanks for your comment. A 17-year Manhattan plan to dismantle the permanent underclass. Even Mississippi has heads. Uh, you know, let me tell you, Mississippi is getting ahead of us. I mentioned... Uh, uh, the ACE Awareness Training, uh, it is now under Mississippi's Medicaid plan. Uh, when are there any of you well uh, familiar with uh, well check programs required under uh, Medicaid and TennCare? Um, but Tennessee does not pay for the counseling and remediation that the children get. Uh, well, they, I had gotten the program to the point where the MCOs were willing to pay for it. I don't know whether they'll cross the bar or not, but Mississippi uh, has been paying for the remediation, remediation and counseling that young children need. It's just automatically. When a mom who is on Medicaid, the equivalent of 10 care in Tennessee, and they take that child in, if they see that there's counsel, counselors are there, and they see that this child is really timid for her age, what's going on? Is there anything going on in the house? Yeah, blah, 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 whatever. I tell you what, we're gonna work with your child. You saying she's crazy? No, ma'am, this is counseling. We're not, we don't have to give her a diagnosis. But I don't have that money, no. Medicaid pays for that. Hopefully we'll get to that place in Tennessee. Uh, speaking of the Manhattan Project, so many people are now saying that if Trump and Biden can come up with new vaccines and just mobilize this whole nation in a period of months, why can't we do it on all these other things? Um, and and you're, you're right. Uh, when you look at what we did, this nation, uh, on the COVID-19, there were no limits. Would not it be nice if someone declared war on neglecting and abusing these children? and having each county to create the board of child protection uh, just to make sure that every time when you walk out of that hospital with all those trinkets and things they give you, that there's a place in there where you go free of charge to make sure that your child is, is not suffering from some trauma uh, or whatever. We'll get there one day. Okay, any, any other questions? Oh, Denise. Um, totally different subject. Um, sure. AC, you've had a long life in public service and so much of that has to do with us as citizens working together and collaborating. What do you think about training young people in civics again, uh, and perhaps adults about the basics of democracy, community collaboration, our elections process and so forth? I mean, maybe when people vote, they wouldn't think that everything was false or believe in every conspiracy and fallacy that is spread out. Just uh, comment. Listen, um, you know, when we, uh, have a president to say we have what? Uh, three branches of government, the president, the 
sent it in that. I've forgotten what it was. Uh, and just so many other um, uh, just illiterate, crazy type things. Uh, one of the things that's eroding the strength of our nation is our children aren't being taught just what it means to be an American, how how government is set up, we got we got rid of it. I I went to a really pitiful public school, segregate, but I knew the difference between the governor, the state legislature, uh, and the Tennessee Supreme Court. That was just I was looking at my five-year-old grandson and he was drawing his little, I know this because he made me the president. Obviously, I'm going to remember that. Uh, but, but no, we need that uh, ever, so, uh, ever so badly. You're absolutely right. And speaking of the president, I'd like to share a story. I, I, I don't think I'll, in, I'll, I don't think I'll embarrass you, Mayor Warden, but when I was at St. Jude, we got this whole truckload of money from NIH for a program. And so the head chief at that time was from uh, Duke. So you can just imagine the ego that he came with since he was from Duke. And he says, Charlotte, I want you to take this program and I want to have a speaker that will pack that auditorium. And I was thinking, <clears throat> I didn't get over the joy of getting the money. Now he's telling me to go get a speaker that can bring doctors and scientists and researchers out of the lab in the middle of the day. And I thought, these people are gonna fire me because I'm not gonna be able to find anyone. But I thought, okay, I'll ask the mayor. At that time, <clears throat> Mayor one was Shelby County mayor. He graciously attended and packed the auditorium. He made me a star. And then soon after that, I was approached again about an international <clears throat> conference that was coming to St. Jude. And they said, can you get that mayor again? Can you get a committee and get the mayor? And I, of course, Mayor Warden graciously, graciously attended and came and did a fantastic job and a, fan, a standing ovation from international visitors from all over the world. And they approached me and said, okay, take this. This is what they said. He should be the president, not, not Obama. The president is right here at St. Jude. Right. So I'm just, I'm just, you, the, the story that you said that your grandson about his drawing reminded me of international people and they just thought the word, I don't think I ever told you that story. Thank but, you. I, I appreciate that. But, but you do know you made me a star at St. Jude, right? <laughs> let, me, let me get you in trouble. You're not working there now, are you? At St. Jude. Uh-huh. You're not working there now, are you? No, uh-uh. Well, I remember that speech because people would always ask me, what's your honorarium? Um, and I, even when I was public defender, I just had difficulties with uh, taking uh, money for doing what came with my job. Uh, so, I finished speaking and Charlotte followed me outside. And she took my hand and she gave me a little folded up envelope. And I said, look, I don't no, I don't take honorary. <laughs> Just keep it, keep it. Well, I got off campus and opened it and she had given me my first campaign contribution. <laughs> 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 so if y'all wondering how she got me, uh, if she did something she wasn't supposed to do, but don't go <laughs> now. No, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for joining us tonight. You already met Verlinda. Uh, everybody, Verlinda, you want to raise your hand? <clears throat> Verlinda is our celebrity tonight. Uh, Verlinda is our Tiger fan, uh, Memphis fan. Uh, true, 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 true to all of us. Our Jeopardy contestant winner was the week before last for Linda. She, she won 17, 
$17,000 on one show. And she was the winner for that show. So Verlinda, and the, the other part, the reason Verlinda's here tonight, other than her being a celebrity, she was a very good friend of our dear friend, Drew Daniel. And she's gonna give us a little bit of update on something that's planned uh, in the future for Drew. Hi, so as Charlotte said, Drew Daniel and I were both Tiger fans. So we bonded over that. He lived in Normal Station. I live in East Bunton. So we're both in the university district and we work together. Um, I'm the chair of the university district Inc. board, which is the nine neighborhoods that surround the University of Memphis. Drew was our treasurer initially, and then he got promoted to our vice president. So he and I worked very closely together and it was such a, a loss and a shock to all of us when Drew died so suddenly. And the university district board has talked about it and we want to honor him in a living way. So what we are going to do in the university district in the normal station neighborhood at 3770 Eccles, there is a normal station pocket cemetery. And this is a historic cemetery that was there for many, many years. We're in the process of clearing it. And we've got paths that are going to be put in with some seating. And it will have a space for meditation for people just to come and be, to come and be present, to have a moment of peace in our busy lives. And so our plan is that we're going to purchase a tree and plant the tree in that cemetery this fall as a living memorial to our friend Drew in his neighborhood that he loves so much and from an organization. And I know from how he talked about you, how much he loved this organization and everything he was involved with. So that's what we plan to do. Um, does anybody have any questions about that? And I'll let Charlotte know when the event happens so she can send an email to you all and we'd welcome you to be there and be a part of the event because this organization was important to Drew, I know. We'll be there. Any other questions, comments? And we also have another visitor, a lot of us already know him because we were so impressed when we went to visit Tech 901 that we could not get off our minds. And the board, has, the board this year, the Midtown board came up with uh, some things we wanted to do since we hadn't really done a lot during COVID. COVID has actually been a great time, a great moment for the Midtown Memphis Rotary Club because we got a lot of strategizing done that we probably wouldn't. And one of the things that we decided to do and Will wrote up the, Will wrote up the request is to honor Will actually to grant tuition to a student from Tech 901. Robert, you wanna speak on that? Thank you. Uh, we really appreciate the support and I think it's a great honor. I, um, I just wanna pause and thank Mayor Wharton for all he did uh, on behalf of Binghampton when I was there with the Community Development Corporation. And uh, there were a lot of strides made on many fronts because of his support. And uh, so I appreciate that. And I see the awesomes are here and they're, as uh, far as I know, lifelong uh, supporters of the Binghampton community. So it's it's good to see friends and fellow uh, laborers. So um, yeah, let me just give you a, a thumbnail sketch. I'd be happy to answer any questions. We, we provide information job training to adults in Memphis that are unemployed or underemployed to help them be the IT workforce that Memphis area employers are, are struggling to fill. So employers give us uh, designated careers and training requirements. We offer um, corporate quality training um, to these adults in high intensity training um, to prepare them for the entry level roles that, uh, that we struggle to fill. Um, and it works. I mean, it's a high school educated person who has a drive to make a career shift can do in 12 weeks, often in our paradigm, uh, a vault 
from uh, unemployment or uh, our average student body income is in the 20, low $20,000 range to our, our graduates first IT job averages about $45,000 now. So it's, it's quick and effective. We've, uh, we've served uh, almost 1400 people. We know of about 360 jobs that our graduates have filled and uh, our, we use our nonprofit status to raise funding to make it economically accessible to all Memphians. So uh, our classes cost either $180 or $250 for a, a full training. And we, and we use donor funds to make that happen. And um, so we appreciate the scholarship. Uh, one extra good piece of news is we have a new matching grant from the Assisi Foundation. So your, your, uh, your support will be doubled. Uh, and then finally, this uh, we've proven to ourselves and I think to many of our graduates that this isn't about ability, uh, this is about opportunity. And so um, with those low pay, we can expand the pool of who has access to this training. And we're, we're very pleased. We were the MLK 50 award uh, winner in Dr. King's uh, Better Jobs, Higher Wages pillar. And uh, we're very, very pleased that about 70% of our students are persons of color and about 35% women. And both of those are way, way above the information technology uh, workforce averages. So we're, we think Memphis can be part of bringing uh, equity and diversity into technology and can lead on this front. So I, again, I, I can't tell you how much our team and I know our students appreciate your support. And uh, again, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. And one thing Robert Beverly Robinson was saying the other day that we are really on the edge of making great strides in IT in Memphis. And I think a lot of that is due to nonprofit organizations like you and your commitment to our community. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Robert. And, and, and one other thing, uh, that maybe we can mention since there's a matching grant, if any of us have an extra $25, $50 or whatever, then will that be matched also? That'll be matched. All new, all new gifts will be matched. Uh, up until what's the deadline? Uh, oh, it'll go six months or so. I don't know the exact date, but late in the year. Okay. Send us an email. We'll get it out. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? No, Comments? No. Also, we have hey, a nice Okay, Pam. Just wanted to know how to contact Robert. Um, we could put it in quick, the Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our website's tech901.org. And my email's easy to remember. It's Robert at tech901.org. Thanks. And, and Denise can also send it out in the next email, next announcement. Thank you, Robert. Um, we also have another distinguished guest from a school that we all love, University of Memphis. Our, we're all Tiger fans, and I see she's in blue. Oh, wait a minute, Pan's in blue, Verlinda's in blue, Denise is in blue, Mayor Warden's in blue. Okay, we're all in blue, so we're all here with the Tiger. Robert has a blue background, so Bernita, uh, give us some news on what the Midtown Memphis Rotary Club did with your request, for your request. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, thank you, guys. It is an absolute honor to be here today. I'm here with the former mayor, the judge, and my favorite, the Jeopardy winner. So I, really, <laughs> I love Jeopardy. So it was awesome to see you all, Verlinda. Um, my name is Vanita Doggett, and I serve as the director of development for the College of Education at the University of Memphis. And um, Charlotte had kind of reached out and had talked to our dean about how you all might support education. And I am pleased to say, and so grateful that you all have um, graciously gifted us $1,000 to award to a student in our teacher residency program at the U of M. And so why this is so impactful is that the state of Tennessee requires that new educators have a year long residency essentially, and they have to do it with a teacher education program provider. And that would be the U of M in our College of Ed. And part of that requirement is that for one semester, 
each student must be in a classroom. They are to work the typical classroom hours. So if your school goes from 8.15 to 3.15, you are there from 8.15 to 3.15 p.m. working with those students. And for many of our students, they cannot work. So that requirement to do that for a full semester means that they must forego part-time jobs, full-time jobs, because ideally they're trying to do what Mayor Warden has talked about here, right? They are trying to ensure that our brightest minds are touched, that they're giving back in a way that is astronomical, that cannot be quantified actually, right? How, what our teachers provide to our students being that stop gap for everything in life. And so, our, our, our education candidates, our teacher candidates can't work. Um, and that becomes a financial strain for many of them. We have been so thankful that we've had other alumni groups and individuals who know that struggle intimately and they've established scholarships. So let me tell you that it doesn't seem like a thousand dollars is a lot until you get to the program where we award those scholarships when we name the recipients. We had a young lady essentially in tears because she was trying to figure out, she had enough for one thing, but she was trying to figure out how am I supposed to make it through this semester, this last hurdle to become an educator, to graduate, how am I going to pay for that? And a thousand dollar scholarship helps out a lot there. We had another um, young man that our director of teacher education got an email from his professor saying that I know that he will be a phenomenal educator. I can see it. I can see the impact he is going to have in the classroom, but I'm worried. I'm worried and I am putting his name in a hat for one of these scholarships. I've encouraged him to apply because I think that if he were able to scale back some of the hours that he is working overnight, he would be more focused, that he could really do that, that his grades would improve, his focus would be better. I know that, that that's possible. And he was one of our uh, award recipients of $1,000 scholarships. And immediately we get an email from his professor saying that he has told his job that he's not gonna be working, that he's been able to now kind of cover his expenses and immediately his performance is better. And so that's the type of impact um, that you all are having and will have on one of our students that we award this scholarship to. So thank you all so much. We are so deeply grateful for your investment in thinking about us at the University of Memphis, and we could not be more pleased to be in partnership in this work with you. Thank you, Vanita. Any, any questions or comments for Vanita? That's great. And, and, and the great thing is Tech 901 and the University of Memphis of the Education Department. I bet you probably can guess what the names of these scholarships or grants will be. Who can, who can take a guess? Denise, you're the smart one. Come on, nerd. Get down Memphis Rotary. Oh, you got it. <laughs> Great. So that, that goes to show that Midtown Memphis Rotary does have a footprint in education. And when we think about diversity and how great diversity is, one of the things I thought about just tonight and listen to all of the great, inspiring, and, and uh, just exciting things that we, that we have. One of the reasons that the Midtown Memphis Rotary can be a pillar and a model is because no matter how diverse we are, and I think we probably are the most diverse Rotary Club, in the, at least in the county, but we all have the same focus. And the focus is unity and us coming together. And no matter how different we are, no matter what our political views, our colors, our gender, we're all about one thing and that's making Memphis better and doing it in a unified way. And it looks like at this point and through education, which is why uh, Mayor Wharton has made such a great impact on what we're, what we're about tonight. And we have Belinda, the Jeopardy education. We have Robert uh, taking care of everybody with Tech 901 and Vanita. So we're just glad that we can be part of a wonderful city, but also part of a wonderful organization. And these little steps really, I'm sure, make a difference in Memphis. So we're all working together with little bitty steps, but even the little bitty steps get us to the gingerbread house. With those little crumbs, we still get there. So thank you, everyone, particularly Robert, Vanita, Belinda, thank you for joining us. Uh, 
Mayor, we couldn't have done it without you. Set, you set this education thing up. If I thought you would, would go for it, I would say, why don't you just be the commissioner of education for Tennessee? But I, I, we're going to leave you there. <laughs> we're going to leave you up there as the Board of Regents. That's a good one. Thank you so much for joining us. And anytime, come visit us. Will do. Good night, folks. Good night. Thank Anything you so else? much. Thank, thank you. you so much, everyone. And thank you thank for your you. service. Good night.